there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. I've been asked a lot about um, our supplies and how long they last. Uh, because I've mentioned in a few videos of certain supplies that don't last very long or things that have gone bad on me. And uh, a few people asked me to make a video on how long supplies last and what you can expect when you purchase supplies and you know maybe what you might want to avoid stocking up on because they might go bad and things you can perfectly well stock up on if you know you're going to use it in the future. I think it's very difficult to um, predict how much of a product we're going to want or we're going to use. I've got a couple of gallons of Mod Podge over in my storage area that um, I was using Mod Podge so much and I thought, oh, I'm definitely going to go through a gallon of this. And I had a coupon at AC Moore and I, I bought a gallon of, um, of Mod Podge. And then I actually went back and bought a gallon of the other kind. Well, I might have got one from Blick and got one from... Um, from AC Moore, but anyway, I was expecting, I was predicting that I was going to go through um, two gallons of Mod Podge before it went back, one gloss and one matte. And of course, at that time, I was doing a lot more crafts with kids. My kids were younger and I was volunteering at the school and I was, um, you know, doing classes at the library. So I was using that a lot more frequently, but, um, and I'd gone through a 16 ounce bottle of it in like probably a few months. And I thought, well, that's a good investment. Turns out I didn't I haven't, I've maybe got like a third of the way through each of those gallons. It's there, it's lasting fine because it hasn't frozen or anything, but I, it made me think about, um, our predictions, our craft predictions. And I've gotten better over the years, but um, because I used to be an art teacher and I used to teach full time and I was responsible for buying my own supplies because it was my own business. Um, you know, I would always be looking to buy in bulk and buy these large quantities. Um, and it took me a while to get used to the fact that no, you do not need to buy humongous quantities of stuff or buy a, a ton of something just because you like it and you're worried about running out. That's kind of um, that's kind of what would drive me to buy like a huge ream of paper because I'm like, oh, I like this paper. I better buy a hundred sheets because they might stop making it or I might it might feel too precious and I might not want to use it if I only have a small amount. Um, so it's really important to know how long it'll last if you have room to store it and if you have room to store it properly so it doesn't go bad. Um, uh, you'll have to excuse me. I took all my notes on my phone because I was when I came up with this idea and I started jotting down notes, I, all I had next to me was my phone. So um, uh, I'm just going to go down through my list. And if you have any questions, if there's something that I missed and you're wondering um, after you watch this video, post it down below and um, I can add it. Um, I can answer your question and or you can scroll through other comments to see if somebody else has um, has has asked it. So we just talked about Mod Podge, which is a glue. It's kind of like uh, similar to your acrylic mediums. It's uh, the binder in it is an acrylic, just like your paint. And um, I would say you probably have about five years on an acrylic based or a polymer based based glue or paint. Now some are going to last a little longer and some are going to last a little shorter. So if you have like a full bottle of glue that you haven't opened yet, you might it might last longer than that. Um, once you've let some air get to it, you're it's going to start to shorten the life. Um, if you have airspace in the bottle, you know, it's it's going to be able to thicken up a little bit and um, and dry up. And once any of these acrylic based products have, have dried, they've actually gone through a chemical reaction. And if you add water and shake it up, it's no, it's it's never going to go back to being a um, a solution again. It's going to be like kind of water and then chunks. So if you've ever found like an old bottle of like craft acrylic paint and you've shaken it up and you've got this big chunk in the middle and you might even have water like kind of on the outside, um, those solid chunks are not going to re-dissolve um, because it goes through a chemical reaction when it dries. Uh, and so think about that when you're buying, especially bottled paint. I find bottled paint lasts lasts uh, less long than tube paint. I think that's because, for one thing, the bottled paint has a little more water in it. Um, it's less um, viscous, it's less uh, concentrated, I should say. And it just tends to it tends to dry out a little bit a little bit more. It's thinner, um, and it tends to go chunky before, say, a tube paint. A tube paint, you well, you think about it. If you've got a tube of of uh, paint, and you squirt out a little bit, your tube compresses and then fits, squeezes around that paint. Right, the air is not back into the tube, but a bottle is a hard. Um, it's a hard shell. I mean, it might be a little squishy, but it's still like it, it keeps its shape. So when you squeeze the paint out, then you're replacing where the paint was with air. And the more air gets to it, eventually is going to dry out some of that. So um, if you are going to, if you do see a great deal on, say, like Liquitex heavy body tube paint, uh, that's going to last you a little bit longer. Like that might last you 10 years because you're going to, as you squeeze it and use it up, you're not replacing the tube with air as long as it doesn't get punctured or something like that. Uh, my Liquitex 
paints have lasted a long time, my heavy body Liquitex paints. The larger tubes do tend to last a little bit longer than the smaller, like sample size tubes. So if you've got some of those small tubes of paint, use those right up because um, I do find that the larger the jar, the longer it lasts because I think because there's so much mass of the liquid in there, it kind of keeps it active and keeps it from setting up, kind of like a gallon of paint. You could have, you could have painted your living room and had like an extra gallon of paint, you stick it in your basement, and then 10 years later, you want to go touch up some areas, and that paint is still fine because you've got all that mass, but if you just had like a, just like a skim of paint on the bottom of that can, you saved it for touching up, that probably would have kind of gone chunky because of all the air in the can. Um, so hopefully that'll help you remember that. So two paints are going to last longer, uh, bottle paints are going to last less long, so uh, definitely, definitely use it up. Um, so keeping on the, um, the theme of paints, your watercolor and gouache paints, those are going to last indefinitely because they're always able to be resoluble with water. Now I'm not talking about acrylic gouache. Acrylic gouache is simply a matte acrylic paint and that would have the similar um, lifespan as your regular acrylic paint. Uh, but your your watercolors, those could last, you know, indefinitely. If you've got like a set of watercolors that were your grandmother's, um, even if they've gone hard in their tube, you can cut the tube off, peel it off from the from the paint, stick that in a palette, add some water, and you've got a pan of paint. It's going to work. So if you did see a wonderful sale on watercolor paints or gouache paint, you could totally, you could buy a lifetime supply if you wanted to, if you have space to store it. But even if you stored it in your garage, your attic, the extreme temperatures aren't going to hurt that paint like it would acrylic. Um, that's the other thing I did want to mention about acrylic paints and glues. Freezing will kill the paint. So um, usually your fine artist supply paints can withstand a couple freeze-thaw cycles, but the bottled paints, because they contain so much water, once you once they freeze, the, the water freezes first and it separates it out from the acrylic and then that's where you get the chunky, uh, the chunky part. So you don't want to store that in your garage, you don't want to store that in your basement. That is if you live in a in a temperate climate like we have here in Maine, and I don't even order acrylic paint, acrylic based products in the winter because I know it's going to sit in cold UPS trucks, you know, during its destination. So kind of keep that in mind too when you're ordering supplies. But you know, kept at perfect conditions, your acrylic paints could last, you know, five to ten years. All right. Um, now other products will last indefinitely. Pastels. Um, color pencils, as long as they don't get too hot, like they melt, like your oil pastels and your regular color pencils, you wouldn't want them to get too hot and melt, um, you know, as long as they don't get wet, as long as you're kept in, you know, decent conditions, they should last indefinitely. Uh, you know, your wax-based pencils could get a little dry, feel a little dry after a while, maybe not be the best feeling products to use, but they, it shouldn't, like the oils could leach out into the wood a little bit, but it really shouldn't, um, that's, that's kind of a stretch, that really shouldn't happen. Um, resin. <laughs> One year, I had to throw away a gallon of resin. It was just like, ugh. <laughs> Even though I bought it with a coupon, which sometimes I think, I think coupons are like the worst thing for me because it makes me buy things that I typically don't need or can't use up or I'm afraid that I'm going to really like a product and use it up and then I won't have it and they'll be too precious about it and not use it at all. So I bulk, I bulk buy. Resin, don't bulk buy it. Buy a big gallon of it if you have a huge project you need to do. But, um, but yeah, a year, and it it, it will it can go hard even without a hardener in it. I had a it was a gallon of or maybe it was a half gallon. It was a big container of polyester resin, and um, it just went it went hard in the container, and I hadn't even put any catalyst in it. So that's and it can get yellow even if it doesn't go hard. It will get yellow um, on you. So yeah, just buy this buy what you can use in a like within six months on that uh, oil paints. If they're capped tightly and no air gets to them, they can last for decades. I've got some oil paint tubes. Some of the the Winton, those large Winton tubes, those last great. I've got some that are 20 years old because I would buy the big containers for my classes, and the big tubes, like 200 milliliter tubes, I think they were. Um, and they last great. They're still in great condition. They haven't really separated. If you do get a little separation, just squeeze out a bunch and mix it together with a palette knife. You could always store it in a jar if you needed to. Um, they last really well as long as they don't get exposed to air. Uh, because then, yeah, they're toast. I mean, you could use this type of solvent to dilute them, but it wouldn't be worth your while, and it would probably make the paint brittle. Um, now, brushes, that's going to vary on your care and use. So if you do see a great sale on brushes and you want to stock up, they're not going to go bad, providing that you store them properly. If you were to stock up on a bunch of, um, which I don't recommend because 
I'm not a fan of fur brushes. Um, you know, if you did have like sables and things like that and you stored them in an attic, well, you know, you would get moth problems, like you'd want to store them with some mothballs or something. Um, but then if the smell of mothballs bothers you, that might bother you when you go to get the brushes out. They might smell like that for a while, so you might not want to do that. But um, brushes generally are going to last, especially synthetics. Uh, but if you're using your synthetics regularly, they may wear down. Acrylic is pretty tough on brushes. You might need to replace those more frequently. But again, it, it's based on your use. And those old crappy brushes, though, I still recommend hanging on to them because they can be really handy for like special effects. I'll save oil, old oil painting brushes that are kind of past their prime, and I'll wash them really good. And they make the best like texture brushes for watercolor um, and for acrylic. So, you know, save them because you might just have just that job that you need an ass seal brush for for texture or something. Or you might have, um, you might want to use them for cleaning something out. Maybe you have a grungy old palette and you want to scrub those wells really good to use it for something else, but you don't want to, you can't get a toothbrush in there and you, you know, you don't want to ruin a nice brush. Perfect to use for those cruddy old brushes. Um, or like sometimes when they get, the brushes get a little past their prime, but they're still, they're still fine. They're just not like, you know, I'm not going to paint a masterpiece with it. Then I'll put them in a bin and then give them to the library because they'll be fine for kids to be, like, younger kids to be playing around with it because it's nicer than the brushes that they already have or that can be purchased for children's use. Um, so just because it's not pristine and perfect for what you're doing now, it could still have a use. Not that I'm like encouraging you to hoard things if you're not going to use them, but I just want to put that out there because, uh, man, I do hate to throw a brush away. I hate to throw, I, yeah, I get really bothered by, um, by trash. I kind of, I definitely have this environmentalist, um, bent, I would say, and I don't like to see things going in the trash, getting, not getting used, being wasted. Uh, if there's a way to reuse it. I'm not perfect, so I don't like to preach or anything like that. But, you know, there's usually another use for something. Um, watercolor. Oh, scrapbook. Let's do scrapbook paper first. Um, actually, my gosh, I'm here scrolling while I'm talking and, and skipping things. Um, as we're talking about brushes, we're talking about things that are that are dependent on care. Uh, yarn, fabric, felt, foam, those can all last indefinitely, providing you store them well. So um, I work in the basement. I have most of my stuff stored in the basement. Um, I keep things, I make sure there's airflow. Uh, I did store my yarn in some big plastic totes for a while, but I would frequently still get in there to get something out. I didn't have any issues with that. I've also stored them on open shelving and in bins and baskets where air can get to them. You just want to watch out for dust. Maybe throw a piece of fabric over the top, like a handkerchief or a bandana or something to keep the dust off them, but so the air can still flow. Uh, that should be fine. You shouldn't get musty smells if you're not having musty smells in your basement anyway. But if your basement is like maybe a dirt floor basement or it is kind of damp and musty and you don't have a dehumidifier or anything to take care of that, maybe store it elsewhere. Or, you know, if you know you just can't store the yarn or the, fa or the fabric in a way to keep it safe, um, and I mean, you could wash the fabric, right, and use it. That's not that big of a deal. But if it's yarn, you've got to, you don't want to wash a skein of yarn. So if you, you probably wouldn't want to be knitting with yarn that smells musty. You know, that might be something to donate. Donate to a senior center or a library or something like that. A lot of libraries have knitting groups that would really appreciate that. Um, so, you know, as long as it's stored well, you should be good. They shouldn't break down on you over nothing, you know, unless you get some, you know, pests or something into them. Um, now there is an exception. So I store my watercolor paper upstairs in a flat, big flat box under my bed because of my 100% uh, cotton expensive watercolor paper because it was an investment. And um, I bought a couple reams of arches back in like, I think it was about 2000. And I paid like 57 bucks for 25 sheet packs. It was crazy. I got rough and cold press. And it's still perfect because I've kept it in a constant warm uh, temperature and humidity environment. Um, if you live in a really humid area, watercolor paper can break down in a couple of years. Like the sizing can break down on it. Like if you're living in a tropical area, I wouldn't buy more than six months of watercolor paper at a time because, or a year maybe because the, um, the sizing can break down. Now, if that happens, you can buy sizing. I think Schmeeka might make it. Um, it's like in a bottle and then you just coat your paper with it, let it dry, and then you can use it. But when you're paying so much for a sheet of paper, uh, I really would hate to have, for you to have to do that. So I would definitely, you know, maybe you could see how long it lasts, but I wouldn't like buy a ream of it and hope it's going to last until you're sure that you have a place where you can store it. Scrapbook paper lasts really well. Again, you want to keep it out of the damp. And But trends change really quickly with scrapbook paper, so I probably wouldn't recommend like um, 
over buying on the pads and whatnot just because it might go out of style before you get a chance to use it. So you gotta kinda know, I'm, I go to, I buy single sheets now. I used to buy the pads when I would go, when I do a lot of scrapbooking and do a lot of card making and make a lot of stuff for craft fairs. Uh, but now I just get single sheets because First of all, I enjoy making my own backgrounds a lot more now, and um, and I just can't use it up. I can't use it up fast enough. So, you know, you want to match your use to your buying, and it can be kind of scary to, like, cut up that single sheet piece of paper you purchased, but it saves money in the long run, really, unless you're using all of the paper. Um, I just discovered that I really don't like having to make a ton of envelopes, so I decided I'm not, I'm going to buy envelopes. I'll make occasional envelopes, but for the most part, I just... I'm buying envelopes now because I just got so burnt out on making my own envelopes. And I did that because I had so much excess scrap of paper and I made tons of envelopes and I'm like, yeah, I'm special occasion only envelope making. <laughs> I don't know. I, I love I love that I can make my own, but yeah, it takes time. Um, let's see. We talked about watercolor paper, alcohol markers. Actually, so I get asked a lot about my marker display here. These are all open stock markers. And um, and yes, I use them. That's why they're here. They're decorative for the set, but they I also grab them a lot and use them. Um, my Copics and Blix can be refilled easily because I can get the refills for them. Um, the other ones, like my Prismacolors and Pro Markers and whatnot, they are disposable. I probably wouldn't refill them after they're used up. Um, if you have a lot of markers, you can save them and take them to a local school and see if they participate in the um, Crayola buyback program where they recycle the, the markers, I don't know exactly how they do it, if they melt them down and make new Crayola markers, but they accept any brand of marker. Um, I have, I'll save like the really light ones and maybe put Gamzol in them and use them for blending colored pencil. But I find that in my climate, my alcohol markers last really well. Um, like my Prismacolors, I, those were the first art markers that I purchased. That was probably in like 2008. And, um, and I used those quite a bit before I got some Copics and some others. Um, and they lasted really well. As long as the marker is well designed, they should last fine. I had issues with the first generation of the Spectrum Noir markers. They would just they would just dry up, and there would be plenty of ink in them, but they dried up. And if that happens to you, you can just add denatured alcohol or like a Copic blending solution to them and revive them, and they'll work just fine. Um, but yeah, they can last. They can last surprisingly long. Kids markers, though, because they have the ventilated caps, so your kids don't, you know, swallow them and choke. They're not going to last quite as long. I would kind of, um, I would let them use up a pack of markers and then buy another pack of markers. And I also had the issue with other art markers that had the ventilated caps, like water-based markers. Um, that the markers would be beautiful when you got them. Like uh, a lot of times they're sold for like adult coloring books, but if they just sit, they do dry out. Even in my, you know, fairly cool environment here that's not like super dry. If you live in a desert, I can't say I bet your markers would dry out. You'd probably be better off having a, a smaller assortment and having some refills so that you can just refill them. Um, and that's but that's completely up to you. I I like having a variety and I do grab these. I'll grab and I work from different brands. I wouldn't have this many markers except for the fact that um, I do get sent a bunch to review from different brands will, will ask me if I want to review them. I usually take them up on them if it, there's something that viewers have asked me to review in the past. So that way I've got kind of a database and then if someone says, what is the tip on the Illustrator marker compared to the tip on the Art and Fly marker? Or somebody gives me a question like that, I can say, oh, the Illustrator is a softer, more flexible tip. The Art and Fly is a little bit more medium and, and uh, then, you know, this brand is firmer or whatever. I can give them a range or I can suggest what marker would be best for somebody. So having that review database is kind of part of what I do here in my business. So uh, so I have a lot more than, than somebody would need. I also do freelance work for a couple different marker brands, doing illustrations for their advertisements and whatnot. Um, so it is something I have for work. Uh, you don't need as many markers as I have. Actually, these I put my I went through all my water-based markers and just uh, tested them all. I probably had a toss about a dozen that I'd used up and the tips had frayed, but for the most part, my water-based markers have lasted really well too. Um, I would say like uh, art markers that are made for adults, like Tombows, they can last, uh, I mean, to use them up, really. Um, like I've got some that I bought at yard sales from like a person that used to have a stamp store. I've had some that I purchased myself that um, 10 years ago and I still grab fairly frequently. The Tombows probably last the best out of all the water-based markers I've used, but um, I've, I've got some whispers on there that last pretty well. I think the ones that last the least are probably the distress markers and the memento markers. Um, I've just noticed they seem to dry out a lot faster than the Tombos. I don't know if they have a ventilated, I think they have a ventilated cap. You know what, I bet that's why. Because 
does that, that yeah they have a ventilated cap and um i don't think the tombos have a ventilated cap so you know that's great if you've got kids but yeah tombos don't have a ventilated cap and that's probably why they last so well so if you don't have children if you're not worried about um about kids choking go for tombos go for markers without ventilated caps because they will last you quite a bit longer uh let's look out what are we at 20 minutes oh my goodness goodness gracious uh ink pads that will vary just like markers on care and use, but um, I prefer ink pads where I can purchase a reinker when I use them up. I usually don't go and buy all the pads and all the reinkers at the same time. Unless I'm at a stamp show and I'm buying one pad, then yes, I will grab that reinker right while I'm there. But if I'm like, I want to try, you know, VersaFine Claire and I get all the VersaFine Claire colors that I want, I probably wouldn't buy all the reinkers until I'm sure I like it. But if I'm buying like one ink pad in black, then I, I will get the reinker right while I'm there and just not even have to worry about it. Because you can reink your pads and um, you can get like one bottle of reinker will usually give you like five or six ink pads worth of ink. So that's like buying five or six ink pads for the price of one ink pad. Um, so until like they start to fray or break down, that ink pad can be used. And I haven't had that issue happen too much. Um, like eventually you're like the Stampin' Up, the old Stampin' Up ink pads would get a little dented in the middle. Um, and, or like the distressing pads might get a little, you might get that fraying on the edge, especially because you're using it on direct to paper techniques. But it takes a lot of inking and a lot of use to break those down. So consider them a, consider them almost like a hob, like a life of your hobby time investment. And you know, if you buy a reinker, you're going to be good, uh, which is nice. It's nice to know you can buy something that's plastic. You don't have to throw it away and buy a new one, although a lot of people do that, um, you know, to each his own. But it's cheaper to buy a reinker and it's better for the environment. So that's what I recommend. Thread. Um, thread will last, I would say, around 10 years. You might get more use out of them, but a good way to check and I can show you really quick. Let me grab, let me grab uh, a spool of thread here. So what you can do is you take a spool of thread, if you're not sure, and you, I, I will wrap it around my finger and then I pull and I try to see it. That snapped pretty easily, so that might not be a really, this thread might be a little past its prime. Um, but if you give it, you probably don't even have to give it that quite that much pressure. You could pull on it and you can see if it, well, yeah, maybe not wrap it around your finger. Like I'm pulling on this, it's not snapping. It took a lot of pressure before it snapped. That would still be kind of on the iffy line for me. But um, if you can break the thread easily, then I would get rid of it. If it takes a, quite a bit of mite to break the thread uh, or it doesn't break at all, you're good to use it. So you can kind of test it like that. Um, rubber stamps. They should last indefinitely um, for, for red rubber or, you know, actual rubber stamps. Um, if your rubber stamp has, it feels really hard and it's not giving you a good impression, what you can do is get vegetable glycerin and you can pick that up at any pharmacy. It's just called glycerin. Or, I mean, you can even get glycerin suppositories and like use that liquid. Uh, it's the same thing. Or you can go into a craft store and pay 10 times more and get like, um, like tech, cake decorating glycerin. What I do is I go to the health food store and I get the Now brand um, vegetable glycerin because I sometimes use it if I'm baking you sometimes use it in like candy making and then I know it's also safe for like if I want to make lip balm or anything like that any sort of like lotions or stuff like that sometimes I like to do crafts like that um, so I know that that glycerin is good for all those things and I've just used the now brand I've always used that brand there's probably other ones um, but you take that and you coat your stamp really well and just leave it on there and the next time you go to use it you don't need to wash it or anything it'll absorb that oiliness and it will um, it'll be nice and soft and supple and it will take your ink again. Don't use oil, don't use baby oil or Pam or anything like that because the oils can break down rubber, but the glycerin will kind of seep in and it'll help draw moisture back into the stamp because glycerin's a humectant and it pulls moisture uh, from the air and that will help your stamp. So that will that'll do the trick. You can also use glycerin in lieu of embossing powder. It, Embossing, embossing ink uh, to hold your embossing powder or mica or whatever. So, um, so that's a nice, a nice tip. If you have a uh, like a water-based blending brush, you can use glycerin in that. Glycerin plus water. And um, the photo, the polymer stamps, photopolymer stamps. I have some personal stamp exchange ones that were like the first ones that came out, and that was probably like, ah, gosh, probably eighteen. 16, 18 years ago. My son was really little. He's going to be 18 this fall. Uh, and they've held up really well. But I've also um, heard people say their polymer stamps have melted. I think it depends if you're, they're getting sunlight. You don't want to store them 
within sunlight, keep them in a binder, keep them somewhere where there's no light getting to them and they should last you, well, I'd say at least 20 years, maybe longer. Yellowing does not affect their ability to, to work. But if they get the sunlight to them, I think that breaks them down because they are a photopolymer process and I think it could kind of ruin them. Uh, the silicone stamps will probably last you even longer. They don't give you as good of an impression, but they are essentially a byproduct. I think they're, because are they real silicone? Yeah, I think that they'll probably last you a really long time. I'm trying to think how, how does silicone break down. I haven't seen any change other than some yellowing or staining on my silicone stamps, like my Inky Dinka Do <coughs> stamps. They, they're still they're still trucking, uh, and I've had some of those for you know 15 years or more. So uh, yeah, take care of yourself. A lot of stuff will last. You want to be careful of liquid products and um, inky products, but. Other than that, like bottled inks, as long as you cap them up tight, some a lot of times you can add some water to them, like uh, India inks, you could add a little alcohol to them and make them resoluble again. Um, it might change your properties a little bit, but you'd at least be able to use them. But you know, you want to keep air out of these products. You want to keep the caps on tight. If you're not going to use them for a long time, put the bottles in a plastic baggie, Ziploc baggie, zip them up, keep the air out and that's going to make your products last a lot longer. And just try not to overbuy. Try not to buy stuff you're not going to use up in the next decade because chances are your, your um, interests will change. Even if you the products are still good, your interests will change and you might not even want to use them. So just try to keep a little moderation there and use your supplies. One other thing that surprisingly that doesn't last very well is washi tape. Washi tape, I've been using them to tape out the borders in my sketchbooks. Uh, to protect the borders because they the tapes lift up really easily and um, if they just kind of sit they can kind of fuse together the rolls of tape and then you can't peel the tape off and it's very frustrating so I uh, use up that washi tape that's one that's so easy to collect and does not last more than a couple of years before it becomes a gummy mess um, that's all I have for today uh, like I said if you have any questions go ahead and leave them in the comments below I'll help you if I can take care of your tools and supplies so they will last you a long time keep metal tools out of humid areas. If you're going to store them in a drawer, put some silica packets in there, you know, save those when they come in bags and shoes, and they will help those metal, um, like, blades and pliers and things like that from rusting. And uh, you should have a nice, long, crafty, and artsy life with your art supplies. I want to thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this helpful, or maybe at least gave you a little company while you were crafting or cleaning or something. Um, and until next time, happy crafting. Bye.